A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. In the original context of this particular passage, Jesus' main point was, you will never rise above your teacher. So if you choose a bad teacher, a blind teacher, you will yourself become blind. And when the blind follow the blind, both fall into the ditch. That being said, the principle also applies if you follow a good teacher. If you follow a good teacher, you will rise to the level of the good teacher. In fact, if you follow the good teacher, you will rise to the level of the good teacher. And that really is the heart of discipleship. Discipleship, if we were going to boil it down to one sentence, is becoming like our teacher. The goal of discipleship is to be like Jesus Christ. In fact, the word Christian comes from the idea of being little Christs, being those who follow Jesus, who are where Jesus is, who become like Jesus, who mirror and imitate, so that when folks see the disciples, they don't see the disciples, they see Christ through the Christians. And as we consider this idea of discipleship and what it means to be like Jesus, the second characteristic that we recognize as being like Jesus is that a disciple learns from God. A disciple learns from God. At heart, a disciple is a learner. It's, it's not right to use the word student for disciple. We today think of students as learner. A student is someone who goes into a class, who takes some notes, write down information, and then on Friday is able to regurgitate it on the test. And that's not bad, but that's not a disciple. A disciple is more like an apprentice. A disciple is more like the one who follows the teacher around and hears how the teacher speaks and watches what the teacher does and goes where the teacher goes and through that learns how to be like the teacher. That's a disciple. A disciple is a learner. And if I'm going to be a disciple of God, of Jesus Christ, I, like Jesus Christ, must learn from God. I want us to unpack this idea just a little bit today. Before we do that, would you bow with me in prayer, please? Holy God, you are our magnificent and holy creator. You are the ruler and sovereign king of this world and this universe. You are the savior of all mankind, especially of those who believe. And therefore, we put our hope in you, the one, the true, the living God, king of the ages, immortal, invisible. To you be honor and glory above all things. And I pray that as we open up your word today, the word that you have revealed by your Holy Spirit, where we can find and meet your son, Jesus Christ, that we will be disciples, that we will learn from you. We pray that this sermon, we pray that this entire hour and a half of worship will be about you and your glory and not about us and ours. May we learn from you. And from your son Jesus, may we learn how to learn from you. We praise your name, Lord God. We thank you so much for loving us. We love you. It's through your son Jesus, our king, our savior, our Lord and master that we pray. Amen. The very first thing I want us to recognize when we're thinking about the idea of being a disciple of Jesus and being like Jesus is that Jesus did, in fact, learn from the Father. I think this might be a little bit shocking to us, but I just want you to see a few passages. If you'll open your Bibles to John chapter 8 and verse 28, or you can just listen to John 8 and verse 28 where Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man... Then you will know that I am he. Here it is. And I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. 
He has not left me alone, <clears throat> for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. He says, I do just as the Father taught me. I speak, Jesus says, just as the Father taught me. Jesus says, I do nothing on my own authority. Before we comment further on that, let's look at one more passage or listen to one more passage in John chapter 5 and verse 30. In John chapter 5 and verse 30, Jesus again says, John 5 and verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. As I hear, he says, I judge. I don't come up with my own judgment. I don't have my own authority for my judgment. I judge based on the one who has passed his word along to me. Again, Jesus says he is listening. He is hearing. He is learning from whom? From God, from the Father. And he says, I don't go about trying to do my own will. I do the will of him who sent me. Can we be shocked about that for just a moment? When we recognize that of all the people in human history, of all the people who have been in this world, who by the very nature of who we are and who he is, of all the people in the world who ought to be able to do just whatever he wants to do, who ought to be able to step out on his own authority, who ought to be able to do what pleases himself. If there was anybody in all of history who ought to have been able to do that, can't we agree that it would be Jesus? Who is himself divine? Who is equal with Father and Spirit? From eternity past, eternity future, God? Surely, if he wanted to, he could do whatever he wanted. But instead, what does Jesus do? What Jesus does do is the will of his Father. And he goes to his Father and he listens to his Father and his Father teaches him. And he says that when I come to you and I start talking to you, it's not my own. I only tell you what I have learned from God. If Jesus learns from God, what should we do? Would you not agree if Jesus himself learns from God, we recognize that a disciple should learn from God? Now, of course, I understand and recognize that Jesus had a relationship with the Father that you and I will never have. The idea of learning from the Father no doubt in the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit has implications and indications that we will never experience and never be part of. Perhaps this idea of learning from the Father is being used metaphorically. And yet the whole reason for using it is to demonstrate that example of how disciples should behave. But perhaps one of the things that's most shocking is that knowing that Jesus, as it says in John chapter 17 and verse 5, in John 17 and verse 5, as Jesus is praying what we often call the high priestly prayer, he says, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The Son was with the Father before the world existed. They had a communion and a communication that we have not experienced. And yet... And this to me is perhaps one of the most surprising things. What we recognize is that a disciple learns from God's scriptures because that is exactly how Jesus learned from the Father. I don't know how all of Jesus' communication with the Father took place. But what amazes me is how when we see Jesus in this life, he learns and lives by the scriptures. Look in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus has been baptized at the end of chapter 3. And now the Spirit has driven him into the wilderness that he might be tempted and tested. And after 40 days of fasting, 
the tempter comes to him. And it tells us in Matthew 4 and verse 3, the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil, not to be put off, took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. All right, Jesus, if you're going to rely on the word, what about this? He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. If we can say one thing for the devil, he's persistent. He doesn't give up easily. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Can we all pause for a moment and be fascinated by the fact that Jesus, God in the flesh, God the Son, God incarnate, comes into the world, and when the devil comes and tempts him, what is it that Jesus uses to determine how he's going to live, how he's going to respond, how he's going to react? He uses the scriptures. It is written. You know... Sometimes as we study this passage, we're not always sure why it was wrong. But here's what I know. Jesus looked at the scripture and said, based on this scripture, I'm going to behave this way. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3 in that first temptation. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16 in the second one. And Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13 in the third. All of those temptations, what Jesus demonstrates is he learns from Scripture, the will of the Father. And he applies the Scripture to his life as he is making choices, as he's figuring out how he's going to act and react and what he's going to do next. It is the written Word of God that teaches the incarnate Word of God what he's going to do next. Friends and neighbors, brothers and sisters, can we not say that if that is how Jesus would live, if that is how Jesus would learn from the Father, what do you think we're supposed to do? Are we not also to take the Scriptures? And as we determine how we are going to act and react and how we are going to live and work and glorify God, that the place we should turn to to learn from God is the same place that Jesus turned to? God's written, revealed word, his scriptures. Brothers and sisters, a disciple learns from God. A disciple learns from God's scriptures. Of course, it's one thing to say that a disciple learns from God's scriptures. It's one thing to say that a disciple learns from what God has revealed in his covenant with them in the written word. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to talk about how. How do we learn? How is it that we take what God has revealed in his word and then apply it to our lives as, Christi as individual Christians, as congregations? How do we determine what our next step is supposed to be? How do we determine how we respond to the world and all that it throws at us? How do we determine how we react to Satan and his temptations and all the choices that he puts out there? Well, I say that we continue to look at Jesus. And I'd like to show you how Jesus used the scriptures and how Jesus learned from God. Look in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12 and verse 49. In John chapter 12 and verse 49, listen to Jesus as he describes his own learning. He says in John 12, 49, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. How did Jesus determine what he was supposed to say and speak? 
How did Jesus determine what he was supposed to teach and preach? How did Jesus determine how he was supposed to live and love and serve? He says, I, I listen to what the Father has told me. He has given me commandments. He has told me to do things. And when I do the things that he has told me, here's what I know. I know that's life. Now that's important. Because sometimes the things that God tells us are hard. Sometimes the things that God tells us actually cause the people around us to rise up and persecute. And you realize, of course, that Jesus doing the things that his father told him led to his crucifixion. The world would have us believe that when we just do what the father tells us, it will actually lead to death. But where did it actually lead Jesus? It led Jesus through death to the resurrection. What, G what the Father commands, what the Father tells, that is life. And when I believe that, I follow in the footsteps of Jesus and I understand that a disciple learns from what God says. A disciple learns from what God tells us. He tells us some things. He says, go do this. Don't do that. You're allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. When we follow what the Father says, do you understand what we are doing? We are learning from God. And when we're done doing that, we can say along with Jesus, I'm not doing that on my own authority. I'm doing that because, look, I've opened up the Scriptures and I've seen where the Father has told me. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus did it that way. I listen to what the Father says. I listen to what the Father tells me. And what he says, what he tells me, I, I do that. I do that. And when I'm done, I'm not acting on my own authority. I'm acting on his because I'm doing what I learned from him. And that's important. Because brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, if we cannot claim that what we are doing is what we learned from him, then we're not acting like Jesus Instead, we're acting on our own authority. Jesus said, I'm not going to do that. Jesus learned from what the Father told him, from what the Father said. We learn from what the Father tells us, from what the Father says. But look again, because there's more to it than simply this. In John chapter 5. In John chapter 5 and verse 19, we hear Jesus once again describing his own life. And he says this. Jesus said to them in John 5, 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. Can I just stop right there and point out, have, have you been picking up on a common thread through several of the passages that we've been reading? Jesus himself says, I can do nothing of my own accord. I do nothing from my own authority. I don't do things because I want to do them. I don't do things because I think they're good. I don't do that. He says, I'm doing this because of God's accord, because of the Father's authority. How much more should we say, I'm not going to do things of my own accord. If I can't tell you where God has revealed that this is right, I'm not going to do this. Because that's how Jesus lived. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. Do you recognize that Jesus not only learned from what the Father told him, from what the Father said, he learned from what the Father showed him. He learned from what the Father demonstrated to him. He learned from the example that the Father set for him. And so we learn that a disciple learns from what God shows. Guys, doesn't this just make sense? If everything it is that we were supposed to know and learn had to be specifically stated out, whew, imagine how big the Bible would have to be. 
But we have some things that the Father says to us through the Scriptures, and we have some things that the Father shows to us through the Scriptures, who demonstrates these things to us through the Scriptures. And as we get into the Scriptures and we recognize that the Father has shown us things to do, has set the example of things for us to do, just like Jesus, we understand when I'm doing those things, I'm not doing it on my own accord. I have learned from the Father. And because I have learned from the Father, that is what I am authorized and allowed to do. Honestly, guys, this isn't brain surgery. It's not rocket science. Uh, or, or actually, maybe it is brain surgery and rocket science. Because you know how those guys figure out how to do brain surgery and rocket science? They watch other people do it. I remember when I was in college, I had a job working as a trim carpenter. So I was the one who put down baseboard, made closet shelves, hung doors, did the trim. And my boss, he didn't just say, all right, Edwin, go turn the saw on, hold the wood like this, do it like that. What he did, he said, Edwin, come over here. I want to show you how to do this. And here's one of the things I learned. There was a period of time. I was in college. My boss had a job that was so far away that I couldn't do my classes during the day and get over to him. And so I actually, for a month or two, worked with another trim carpenter in the area that actually my boss had trained. And when you're dealing with the idea of trim carpentry, you know there's actually more than one way to skin a cat in that arena. And what you learn from different carpenters is they all have their signature, if you will. There, there's the way they do it. And when these fellas had left my boss, they wanted to set their own signature. They had their own way of doing things. You know what they had to do when I started working for them? They had to show me because when, when somebody found out that they had trimmed out that house, they wanted it to look a certain way. They showed me. I had to do it based on their authority. I wasn't allowed to just go into the house and do whatever I wanted. So when I did what my boss or these other bosses showed me, was I doing it on my own accord? Was I doing what I had figured out on my own? Or was I doing what I had learned from the one who had authority? You see the point? And this is exactly what Jesus says. Jesus says, I do what the Father has shown me. There's some things he's told me, and there's some things he's shown me. And Jesus is pointing out, when I do the things that he's told me, and I do the things that he's shown me, I'm not doing it on my own accord. I am doing it according to the one who actually has the authority. How do I learn? A disciple learns from what the Father tells him, and from what the Father shows us. But again, if every single thing had to be directly stated or had to be demonstrated and exemplified, man, the Bible would be almost unending. And so there's another principle that we learn from Jesus. We find it in John chapter 7 and verse 24. In John chapter 7 and verse 24, I just want you to hear the statement, then we're going to back up and put it in context so that we can figure out what's going on here. In John chapter 7 and verse 24, Jesus says to those who were rebuking him, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Jesus was highlighting to those who were coming against him that they were supposed to make some judgments. But they were supposed to do so with right judgment. It's possible to make a wrong judgment, to use logic and reason and human judgment and go astray. He says, don't do that. He says, as you're trying to figure out all these things, judge with right judgment. Now let's put that in context to see how that impacts us. What's going on here in John chapter 7 actually began back in John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath day, and the Jews were upset. How dare you heal somebody on the Sabbath day? You're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. <clears throat> and so... Here in John chapter 7, as Jesus is now at this feast, he says to them, oh, let's see here. Verse 21 is where I want to begin. Jesus answered, this is John 7, 21. Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. That's the healing the fellow on the Sabbath. Now here's his explanation, verse 22. 
Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? You see, what Jesus is pointing out is, look, I, I, I'm not going to go to the law and find a place where the Father said, heal people on the Sabbath. To my knowledge, I can't go anywhere in the old law, in that law of Moses, and find where anyone, it expressly was stated, they were healed on the Sabbath. What is Jesus doing here? He is inferring from what the law said. He's saying the law implies some things. He says, I'm using reason and logic and judgment to take a look at what the Father said and what the Father showed, and because of that, I know that this too is something I have learned from the Father. He said, look, here's what I know. We've got the law that says don't work on the Sabbath, but we've also got the law that says circumcise on the eighth day. And if if circumcision falls, if the eighth day falls on the Sabbath day, we're going to circumcise because otherwise we're breaking the law. He said, now look, If we can offer a blessing to one of God's children by performing a surgical procedure that impacts the body on the Sabbath, then I can offer a blessing that makes a man's body whole. If we can remove a part of a man's body to give him a blessing on the Sabbath, we can make his body whole to give him a blessing on the Sabbath. Now, I recognize that we today, as we're trying to walk through what Jesus said, we may struggle. We may want to argue with Jesus. I'm not Jesus, so I can't answer all the questions you might have against what Jesus said here. You might say, oh, that's not logical. That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, I mean, we can talk about that later, but I'm not Jesus. So I can't answer you all the way Jesus would. But here's the thing I'm wanting us to see for this lesson. Do you see the judgment process that Jesus walked through? Jesus said, here are some things that I know were said Here are some things that I know were shown, and as I piece these things together, that implies that on the Sabbath day, I am allowed to heal people. He learns from what the Father implies. And so what do we discover? A disciple learns from what the Father implies. I don't have to look for a direct statement about everything or or an absolute demonstration about everything. And I understand this is a struggle for us because there is human judgment and we have to be very careful because Jesus himself says, don't judge by appearances, judge with right judgment. That means we can use our judgment and be wrong. But when I have used right judgment and I have taken what the Father has said and what the Father has shown and I have drawn logical, reasonable conclusions from that Jesus points out I'm not doing that on my own authority I'm doing that by his authority I'm doing what I have learned from the father how does a disciple learn from God a disciple pieces together what God says and what God shows and recognizes that there are some implications there's logical reasonable conclusions that we can draw from that and when we act based on that We're not acting based on our own learning. We are acting based on God's. And so, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, it's one thing to say that I'm going to learn from God. It's one thing to say that I'm going to use his scriptures and learn from him. It's another to figure out, well, well, how? How is it that I learn? You know, the interesting thing here is when we talk about this, what we've said is, well, I learn from what God shows me, what God says to me, and what God implies through those things. And isn't that actually how we all communicate with one another all the time? It's not, like, it's not like this is just made up out of thin air. It's not like we've actually had to work through something. The problem is, is that for some reason when we get to the scripture, people have an idea that it doesn't work just like communication works. And, and normally, honestly, guys, that's because a lot of times we just want to do what we want to do and we're going to figure out how to make the scripture let us do what we want to do. And we can't live like that. What we need to do is learn how to live the way the scripture actually teaches. And we learn from the scripture by taking a look at what the Father says and tells us, what the Father shows us, and what the Father implies. 
And if I, if I can't find that, if I can't go to the Scripture and say, look, this is it. This is, this is where the Father has told us this. This is where the Father has shown us this. This is where I can draw the reasonable, logical conclusion from the Father implying it. If I can't do that, where did it come from? It came from me. And so let's, let's stay there in John chapter 7 for just a moment because I want you to think about why this is important. Why this is important. The reason I'm sharing these things with you today is not because, well, we've got to come up with some rules that tells us the rules that we're supposed to follow so we can go to heaven better than someone else. That's not the issue here. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 7 and verse 16. So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Here's why this matters. When I do things, supposedly in the name of the Lord, from my own authority, because I decided for some reason and in some way that it must be okay, who is the one that gets glorified? Me. And I am not worthy of that glory. But when I determine that I am only going to do what I have learned from the Father, and I restrict myself, and the congregation restricts itself, to do only what we can learn from the Father, from what the Father has told us, from what the Father has shown us, and from what the Father has implied through that, do you know who gets the glory then? God does. And the reason why learning from God matters is because God's glory matters. May we always learn from God. How are you doing at that? If you'd like to, you can put your Bibles away in your notes. We're going to be singing one more hymn. Brother Adam's going to lead us in that. I'd like to share with you as we wrap up something I learned from the Father. I learned from the Father how to become one of his children. And what I learned is that the Father so desperately wanted me to be one of his children. So intensely, maybe that's a better word, so intensely wanted me to be one of his children. That he sent his one and only son to live in the world. in order to die on a cross and then be resurrected on the third day. And through him, as my king, I can be God's child. And Jesus explained that if I wanted to respond to this gospel message, this good news of his kingship and his kingdom, he said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Through the apostle Peter, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Spirit. This is what he says. And you know what he shows over and over again? People who believe in Jesus Christ 
turn away from their sins and surrender to him in baptism, being immersed in water, raised to walk in a new life. Will you learn from the Father how to be his child? If we can help you with that, won't you please come to the front right now as we stand and sing?